extend you the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ this day. Today we look at the Old Testament reading from the book of Exodus to gather some spiritual enlightenment from what God has to share with us in our life as individuals and as a community for our church. Please join me in prayer. Father, sometimes it's really hard to believe your promises. It's hard to look at all the cemeteries and believe that there will be a resurrection of the dead. It's hard to believe that those things in Scripture really happen because they seem so abnormal to life. Help us, O oh Lord, know that they did truly historically happen and the promise of the resurrection will be an historical event. So when we are strengthened in these historical aspects of these promises and events, we, O oh Lord, are strengthened in our faith for what we challenge today. We ask for your blessings upon our faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, back in 1973, our church was challenged severely with this kind of thought, historical criticism. Historical criticism had crept into our seminary at St. Louis. The president and much of the faculty was supporting it. Historical criticism was the idea that History never happened in the Bible. There was no Noah. There was no flood. There was no Jonah. There was no whale. There was no division of the Red Sea. The story was just a novel. And we as pastors and clergy must do everything to help our lay people really get to the nitty gritty of things by convincing them that these things never historically ever happened. What took place because of that teaching? Well, 1973 at the New Orleans Convention, which my dad was a delegate on Committee 3, he ended up firing all the faculty at Concordia Seminary St. Louis except for the faithful five. Those that were fired, along with their students, went to find another seminary in Chicago. They located a place, and with funding, they created what was called Seminex which is short for seminary in exile. That was a challenge for our church in 73. I started seminary there, instruction in 83, 10 years later. The seminary was just beginning to rebuild its faculty. Now that I've also attended classes there in my doctoral instruction, I see now that our seminaries are being faced with this thought called post-liberal theology. Post-liberal theology recognizes that historical criticism was not the way to go about educating the lay people. What we need to do is just say, whether they were historical or not does not matter, but we don't want to prove anymore or argue against whether or not they were historical. What we want to do is just focus on the story. What does the story have to say? In other words, they want to look at scriptures like a novel. You know what novels are? Novels are stories that are not true, but set in historical settings. Perfect example of one, Gone with the Wind. It's a novel, good one, made a movie out of it. And that's novel, it's set in the backdrop of the Civil War, which historically happened, and the Restoration. But that's it. There was no Rhett Butler. There was no historical Scarlett O'Hare. There was no Tara mention, and there's no one saying, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. All fiction. This is what post-liberal theology wishes us to look at the Bible as novel. But pause for a moment and think what takes place when you separate history from the events of the scriptures. You're going to get a much weaker, smaller God. What you get is a God that's not in control of history, a God that's not capable of working miracles, a God that basically is just a glorified man who had the writers write a story that made him look bigger than what he actually was. That's what happens when you separate history from the Bible. It is very, very important for us as Christians to maintain 
these biblical events are truly historical, for it shows the power and the glory of God. Take, for example, the story of the Exodus. Did it really historically happen? How many of you have ever seen the Red Sea split in your life? Can't say we have. How many of you have ever seen plagues like they had in the time of Moses, where it was very selective, as a matter of fact, that the only one that died were the firstborn, nobody else in the family. That the only one that died were those that didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doors. How is that even humanly possible? It must not have happened. It's just a good story. It makes God look big, bigger than he actually is. The story in the book of Exodus really shares with us the power and the glory of God, that God controlled history in such a way that he allowed his people to be subjected to slavery for 400 years in Egypt. Now, when you and generations before you are subject to slavery for like over 400 years, what do you think your possibility of liberation is? Zero. There is no human way possible that we can ever be freed from the Egyptians. They are too powerful. They are too mighty. We have nothing to use against them. Then all of a sudden, God shows up. He sends his servant Moses, gives Moses powers, and make Moses like a god to Pharaoh, the scripture says. The plagues are done. Deliverance has worked. And his people are set free. What do you think the people thought of God when this happened? That he was almighty. That he was glorious. That he was much bigger than they could ever fathom. Because there's no way any human being could have ever, ever done this. But if you want to just say it's a story in a novel, that's okay. But now, what have you done to God? A being that is way above us now has come way below us. We as Christians struggle, sinful human beings struggle, because we're so self-centered. We're kind of people like, you know what, if I don't see the Red Sea splitting in my life, it never happened in anybody else's life. So it could not have happened. We struggle because we don't see those biblical miracles in our life. And rather trusting and saying, yeah, they truly historically happened, we tend to say, nah, I'm not seeing it, so it's never happened. Today in the Old Testament, we've got another story. 600,000 people are freed from Egyptian slavery. A month and a half later, only a month and a half later, after they've seen the plagues, after they've seen this great thing of the splitting of the Red Sea, they begin questioning God and Moses. They go to Moses and they start saying, you know what, we're looking at the pantry shelves here and they're getting a little empty. How are you going to feed 600,000 people in the wilderness we see before us? That is not humanly possible, Moses. As a matter of fact, they looked at their predictum and said, I'd rather go back to slavery. Can you believe that's how bad they thought their situation was? That they would choose slavery over giving God a chance in the wilderness? The Israelites said to Moses, if we only had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, you, you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. There is no way you can feed 600,000 of us in the wilderness for any length of time. God, therefore, gave them another opportunity to grow in faith. Put them in slavery for 400 years to help them understand the power and glory of God. And now they're facing this wilderness and God is saying, you will see my glory and power again. Because you're right. There's no humanly way possible to do this. But I'm much bigger than a human being. And he provides manna in the morning and quail in the evening. And he does this for a couple of reasons. He does it in Exodus chapter 16, if you really kick down the phrases, that I'm going to do it to test them. I'm going to see whether or not they're going to believe that I'm going to provide for them. And that they should pray to me, give us this day our daily bread and not weekly and monthly bread. Because he told them how much bread should they pick up per day? Enough for the day. And if they didn't trust him, 
They went and picked up two days worth. What happened to the second day worth? It rotted. That says, I am putting you guys to the test. And a wilderness is a good place for the test because you are removed from all trust of earthly institutions and earthly power. They will see my power, they will see my glory, and they will know that I am the Lord, I am their Lord, the God of Israel. Put to the test for their growth of faith. One of the biggest things that we have as Christians that is challenged today is whether or not the resurrection of Christ actually even happened. What would that do to the Christian faith if there was no historical resurrection of Christ? What would happen to be if they actually found the bones of Jesus somewhere in a grave? What would that do to the church? What would that do to your faith? Was it just a story? Was it just a novel to see what God is really kind of dreamed to be like but not like? We'd be in sad shape if the resurrection of Christ is only just a story. Therefore, when we look at the resurrection of Christ, we see the power of God in the resurrection. No one can raise somebody from the dead, especially after they've been dead three days, except one person, God himself. Even St. Paul had to struggle with the idea that there was no resurrection of the dead in his time. This is back 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. There are people in the church arguing the fact that It's impossible for the dead to be raised. There is no resurrection of the dead. The promise of the resurrection will never be an historical event in the history of mankind. Paul challenges these people saying in 1 Corinthians 15, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then you have to admit that Christ is not even raised from the dead. Follow your logic. And if Christ has not been raised, then what I'm doing, and I've been doing for 30-some years, all this preaching and serving is in vain. Your faith is vain, too. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses and liars, to be telling you something that was historical that wasn't, that Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then you must admit not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Because there's no atonement for your salvation. There's no victory over death, sin, and the devil. If this has not historically happened, we're in a sad state. And that's what St. Paul sums it up saying. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, in this life only, We are all people most to be pitied. That's what happens when you take history out from the biblical events. We as Christians believe in something that is above the laws of nature. A resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who died to atone for our sins and now lives in glory with his Father. And because he does and because we believe, we too shall live in glory with him. And I must admit, as we're looking at the near future of Christ the King, I kind of think that maybe God's going to put us in the wilderness here for a little while. He's going to test us. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, you look at the economy, and I have people telling me, you know, that it's getting tight around here. Inflation is really hard, not able to keep wages up with what costs are happening. And how in the world do you want to build a church right now? It's not possible. We're saying the same thing they said years ago in the wilderness, aren't we? We're looking at a wilderness and we're saying, Lord, can you actually provide for 600,000 people plus during these next few years? Can you do it? It's not humanly possible. That's true. It's not humanly possible. I admit it. But is it divinely possible? That's the question we pray about today, isn't it? Are we being led into the wilderness Is the economy the way it is? Is our situation the way it is? Because God is saying, I'm going to have you, Christ the King, grow. I'm going to have you grow in your faith. 
I'm going to have you see my power and glory of what I'm going to accomplish for you in the next few years. I've got you there for a reason, for your benefit, to see my glory. Today's world, you know, we have people in the business world that are called entrepreneurs. You know what the word entrepreneur means? Risk taker. Risk taker. In the business world, you take risks to get ahead, but they're called calculated risk. Calculated risk according to human possibility. But in our world, in the church world, we have to remember we're dealing with another dimension than humanity. We're dealing with divinity. And so we don't take risks, we take steps of faith, wondering and praying to God, oh God, show us what is divinely possible and what is your divine will for us. And show us, oh Lord, in ways in which you do things we didn't even think were possible. For we see your glory, you see your power, and we know you are our Lord. By believing in the biblical events as historical events, our faith is strengthened that God can do things that are not humanly even possible. And it's a blessing for us sometimes to go into that wilderness, to be stripped of all human conveniences and human possibilities, and just ask God to give us our daily bread. And he does. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Please see our Lord's